How we doing? Are y'all excited about this longer 4th of July weekend? No? Nobody else is excited. No? All right. Okay. Hey, well, let's, uh, let's show our gratitude um, to our Lord. I was thinking this morning, um, just, uh, um, just after, uh, well, listening to uh, some of Keeley's message this morning and then um, in, my, in my reading this morning, um, my reading came out of the book of Numbers, and so we know how exhilarating the book of Numbers is. Um, but it was just talking about, uh, and I promise I won't ramble for long, but it was just talking about um, uh, the Lord giving instructions to Moses about separating the Levites, right? And so he's going through the cleansing process and all this, but, but literally about separating them uh, aside for his own service, right? They, they were consecrated uh, just to serve in the, uh, in the temple uh, and to be his priests, right? Um, and so it, it just struck me just going through uh, just how, uh, how intricate that process is and how much of a gift this is for us, right, to, to be in his presence um, and just to be able to welcome him in and usher him in um, as, uh, as many places as we have been. Um, but God still uh, just opens the doorway to us. Um, and so let's, uh, let's see this as a gift that we get to praise and worship him this morning. Amen. Um, I know it's, it's surrounded uh, around us all the time, um, but let's just focus on that, uh, that God, this is a gift uh, that you have given to us, so we are grateful for it. Um, so church, let us stand and let us worship him, amen? Let's do it. Sing, I was buried, I was buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn till I met you I was breathing but not alone My failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave.
Happy 4th of July weekend. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, my name is Keely Allen. I am the children's pastor here. And um, just a couple of announcements. One, happy 4th of July. Uh, two, we have a garage sale coming up in August. So please dig through all of the things that you've been wanting to get rid of. Uh, because soon you will have a place to bring them. And uh, three, mark your calendars for Lord's Acre. First weekend of October, it is coming. We are excited to be able to host uh, Lord's Acre again. And now it is time for all of our kiddos to come up and join me for just a second before we go to worship for a special blessing. Can you all come join me? I'm so happy to see you today. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, and I'm so glad you're here. Isn't it a special day that we get to worship the Lord and learn about him and everything that he is? Today, you are going to be talking about being thankful. Do you know what that is? Well, you're going to find out. I bet you there are many things in your life that you could be thankful for. You think? So while you're worth walking over, I just want to encourage you to begin to think about having a thankful heart. Can you do that? So can you pray with me? Let's pray. Ready? Dear God, we thank you that you are who you say you are and that you do what you say you will do. Open up our hearts wide and big so that we can hear your message. We can understand what it means to be thankful and we can know more about who you are and who we are in you. God, I ask that you bless these children for everything they are and everything that they will be. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Okay, y'all are going to go with Miss Nicole. She's right over here. Can I walk you there? Thank you. Awesome. Church, let's continue in our worship. Jesus, you are worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring.
Tell him again, I'll build.
shaken. Uh, though fear would try to come in and take away our peace, uh, we know that our peace is not based on circumstances around us. Our peace is based on the faithfulness of God. Amen. And his faithfulness never, never ends. Let's sing about his faithfulness. Sing, be still, be still. is Promises us, surely love.
and I won't be afraid. Surely love, surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Keep singing the church. Surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Surely love and mercy, your peace and kindness will follow me, will follow me. Oh, let those be your words. Surely love, surely love. Oh, God, that's all we have to say. Surely your love, surely your mercy, God, will always follow us. And so, God, in this moment, Lord, we, uh, we surrender our fears. Uh, we surrender these things that would hold us back, these things that would, that would dictate where our life is supposed to go. But all of this, all of this needs to take a seat in your presence. All of it takes a seat in your presence. God, surely love and surely mercy will follow us all of our days, and we will rest in your presence for all of eternity. That is our story. That is our story. All because of what you have written, because of what you have decreed, and what you have set up. And so in victory we stand this morning. In victory we praise and we worship you this morning. In victory, we have all these things, all these gifts that come from you, Christ Jesus, you and you alone. Your peace will follow me, will follow me, surely. Church, you may be seated. But church, we were given another gift. Uh, it's this prayer that we get to share in unison together. Uh, this prayer that gives us a, a rubric for what it looks like to have a relationship with the Father. And the truth that is spoken and is written down, written down so, so long ago. And indeed, it has walked through the paces of time, no matter what has gone on in humanity, no matter the highs or the lows or any of this, it has stood that test of time. And so we get to say it this morning. It is our gift to say it together this morning. So let us say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. so happy you're here. If I, I think I said this earlier, but if I haven't had the privilege to meet you, my name is Keely Allen. I'm the children's pastor here. So I handle all kinds of things, kids. 
Um, so if I seem a little bit more animated than Pastor Brady, well, I would apologize, but this is just how I am. So it works out well for me and kids. They need a little bit more animation, right? Sometimes we do too. Um, yeah, so Pastor Brady, he's on vacation. He can't be here today. So we hope and pray that he is having an amazing time with his family, getting refreshed and restored. Uh, if you will keep Pastor April in your prayers, please. Um, she has had a family emergency and has not been able to be here today. So please keep her and her family in your prayers. So I've been given this opportunity to um, preach. And, well, if you know me, you know that I really like to talk. And I really, really like to talk about Jesus. So um, it took me a while to kind of narrow down what we were going to be talking about. Because, well, this is a big book. It's actually a library of books. So trying to figure out what that looks like was um, quite difficult because there's a lot of really good truth in it. Um, and I happened to be on social media this week. Um, TikTok, in fact. Please don't judge me. And I heard just a very short snippet. It was about 45 seconds of someone talking about the veil. Now, you may not know what the veil is, and that's completely okay, or which one I'm talking about, because there's a lot. But I'm specifically talking about the one that is in the temple, and that was torn from the top to the bottom whenever Jesus died on the cross. And I'm going to read the scripture, and then we're going to come back to that, okay? So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me um, to Matthew 27. We're going to read from 45 to 54. Don't worry, they're not too long. Mainly focusing on 51 for the rest of our, our time together. It says this, it says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness overcame all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So there's a whole lot going on in that passage. And I know that it's not Easter um, but I don't think there's ever a wrong time to talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus and the atonement for our sins. So the TikTok, who was talking about the veil, well, it just kind of intrigued me. Uh, they described it in a way that I had never heard before. And really, in reading through this scripture over and over again throughout the years, I've just kind of glanced, glossed over, glanced over that one particular sentence. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So I began to do a little bit of research. We've got a couple of stories in Godly Play uh, that we use in children's worship during the school year that talks about the temple and how it's constructed and what's in it. Uh, we even talk about the tent and how it was constructed in the desert. But I don't guess... Um, I had ever really stopped to notice this particular verse and why it would have been so important. 
Um, now, I'm all good for like a really good object lesson. If you know me and you know kids, there's always something fun to learn. I either have little trinkets I give out or some big thing and we talk about it and how it relates to the story. Um, but the veil is just way too big to go near here. So I'm going to tell you a couple of statistics that may change your idea of what the veil or the curtain may have looked like. When I read this verse, I see a, a veil. I think of a wedding veil. Or I think of, you know, some curtains or some good drapery, right? That's not at all what the veil does. If you look up, and I'm sorry, I've got lights that are in my eyes, but if you look up at the very top, just take a look. That right there is right at 40 feet, 37 give or take a couple of feet. So about 40 feet from the very, very top of the point in our building. Now that's pretty high, right? The veil was actually 60 feet. So take half of this building and put it on top. And that is the height of the veil. So definitely not a drapery and definitely not a wedding veil. It was huge, and it was about 20 to 30 feet. There's some discrepancies on that wide. So that's about a little bit taller, well, about halfway to the top is 30 feet. So I just want you to stop and close your eyes and open your, your, your imagination into what that might look like. Now, on top of that just the enormity of the veil. Um, when we're reading, and I'm reading some historical documents, what we find over and over and again is that the veil was actually about the, um, the width of a palm. Now, I was really very interested about that because, um, well, palm size varies. Um, really based on height and body type, right? So I'm a little bit short on the shorter side, a um, little bit more vertically challenged. And so I, I began to just even look at my palm. It's about four inches. So if you can imagine a curtain or a veil that was four inches thick, 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide. That's the veil that tore from top to bottom. It was hand sewn by about 82 young ladies. It is said that um, it took 300, and I actually went to clarify that in a couple of different spots because it just seemed like an extravagant number, but it's not, it's the truth. 300 priests to take the veil down wash it if it had gotten dirty, lay it out where it needed to go into the temple um, areas, and then put it back up, 300. So does that change your perception of the veil being torn? It's also said that whenever you take two horses and you have them going in the opposite directions, it was so strong that it did not tear. So what we know is that it can only be an act of God that the veil was torn from top to bottom. Not just a small tear, an entire tear from top to bottom on something that man could not do. That changes a couple of things for me whenever I read the scripture, so I'm going to read it for you again. At that moment... The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Every gospel confirms and believes that the veil was torn because of Jesus' death. That because of his surrender and his sacrifice, the curtain or the veil in the temple was torn. Now, why is that significant, right? 
They're like, okay, Keely, you've given me a whole bunch of facts. Great. Now I can envision it. Great. But why is it important? And what does this tell us about God? And what does this tell us about where we are in this story? Well, I kind of learned like about three things. So if you can hang with me for just a few minutes, I want to talk about three things that I feel like this has um, revealed to me. So some other kind of cool facts about this is the veil separated the holy place in the temple from the holy of holies, where the presence of God dwelled. Now, before Jerusalem was destroyed and they had to rebuild the temple and the ark got lost, the ark would sit in the holy of holies. And I imagined that place, I imagined it to be very bright and light and, right? The presence of God, right? It has to be bright. But in fact, it wasn't. There were no windows, and there was this four-inch thick veil that covered the entrance, and it was dark. But the day that Jesus died, the veil was torn, and suddenly all that was mysterious about who God was, was revealed. You see, as a Jewish person, not knowing Jesus, we have complete and total access to him, right? They didn't. The way that they knew God was bound up in laws and rituals. It was bound up in the way that they worshiped. They could read about who he was, but having direct contact and access to the presence of God was something that they could not bear. They were not allowed. And so it's very easy to see the character of God whenever you're reading those scriptures, but it is incredibly hard to know the heart of God. I believe that whenever the veil was torn where all of that went away when the veil was torn and Jesus died on the cross and his sacrifice was enough the way that things were changed we could see the heart of God for the first time you could experience the presence of God for the first time. I wonder if you've ever been in a place where you feel like God is distant, where he isn't accessible to you, where you're over here and He's in that place that says, I'm not allowed. Our mind and our experiences can often tell us lies that we choose to believe. And it's only whenever we begin to seek the truth in the word that we can see the truth for what it is. That there is no distance. There is no veil that separates us. That we have complete and total access to him and that we can know the heart of God. The second thing that I think that it helps us understand, the veil being torn helps us understand, is that we have an invitation. So everything about the way that Jewish people worshipped in that time kind of said, like, stay out. Okay? There were lots of rules. 
just even on the temple grounds, there were lots of bulls. There was a court of women. There, there were sacrifices. There were all of these things all the time. And over and over and over again, you would hear and see, like, sorry, not allowed. Sorry. Sorry, you can't enter here. So, sorry, I know God's back here, but you, 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 you can't go back there. Sorry. Um, at the very center of Jewish worship, all of these amazing things happened in the Holy of Holies, but there was only one person, one day out of the year, that could go there. And in that, it was called the high priest, and he had to do all of these rituals in order to go behind the veil. He had to dress a certain way. He had to bring the, the, the blood of a goat he had to say special prayers, and he had to go in and sprinkle blood to ask for the atonement of the sins of the people. And if he did not follow any of those, not just like, oh, well, I forgot that one. It'll be okay. Nope, you're struck down. Just struck down. Another priest wanted to go there? Struck down. Everything about the way that they worship said, you're not allowed. You're not allowed. You're not invited. You're not enough. But what we see in the veil being torn, in Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, what we see is that God has an invitation. There's a free standing invitation into his presence, into his healing, into salvation. And Charles Spurgeon wrote something that I found that I just love, and I'm going to read it to you. He said, there's an entrance made for the greatest sinners. If there had only been a small hole cut through the veil, the lesser offenders might have crept through. But what an act of abounding mercy is this. That the veil is rent in the midst from the top to the bottom so the chief of sinners may find ample passage. It wasn't a tiny hole that you could peek through to kind of look to see what's on the other side. It was torn from the top to the bottom, it didn't matter how small or how big you were, you had access to the creator of the universe. That there is no sin too small or too big to keep you, to separate you from the one who created you. Hallelujah and amen. Yeah. There's a story that I read about a doctor in England. His name is John Duncan. He was sitting in service one day, and he was very downtrodden just about his life and kind of where he was and his faith and lack of and circumstances and his reactions and his sin. And as the elements were being passed around to take communion, he... Um, well, he passed on them. He said, oh, I, I can't. This, this is not for me. My life is too messed up. And you thought, well, maybe that's the end of the story. He noticed as the rest of the elements were being passed to the rest of the congregation that there was a teenage girl who also passed on the elements. She didn't partake. And she was so overwhelmed and guilt-ridden with her sin and her life that she began to weep. Now, the doctor was a quiet man. He was not one to stand up in front of the congregation and say anything, but he whispered just enough where the entire congregation could hear. And he said, take it. Take it. It's meant for sinners. 
she went back and she was able to take communion that day. And then he realized that he was preaching to himself that he was also forgiven, that he had full access to God, and that it was meant for him too. Here in a few minutes, we're going to take communion. And when you take it today, I, I hope my prayer is for you to know that you're forgiven, that you are enough that you have access and that you are wanted and loved. The last thing that I learned in just reading um, is that our hope is secure. We are anchored in the right place. Now, have any of you ever been on a boat and needed to anchor anyone? Anywhere? Anything? Have any of you ever been on a boat and you needed to anchor? Like you needed to just stay in the place? Yeah? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Good. I, I'm a kid's pastor. I'm used to like, you know, response. So feel free. Um, yeah, so my dad and I, we would go fishing whenever I was little. We'd get up really early in the morning and go fishing. And if we didn't anchor the right way to the right things, we would often drift. And when we drifted, we, we didn't go to the places that we were supposed to. Most of the time, it was into the brush, and then my dad would get really mad, and then it was not good. If you anchor in sand, do you think that you stay where you are? No. You have to anchor to something hard that doesn't move. And in Hebrews, in Hebrews 6, 17, this is what it says. And I promise this has a point, so just, just stay with me. So when God decided to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, who have fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever. Who is the only one allowed in the Holy of Holies? The high priest. And at Jesus' death, he became the high priest. And what we know is that we are anchored. Our faith, our salvation, our relationship is anchored in the holy of holies. In the dwelling place of God. And that our future is secure. And I don't know about you, but man, I feel a whole lot better whenever I read that. I feel a whole lot better knowing that Jesus is the high priest. It's not Aaron and it's not Caiaphas. It is Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, Son of God. It is Jesus who holds that place. And he says, we have access. He says, there's nothing that can separate you. He says, you are enough. He says, welcome, I want you, come to me. He says you are, are loud in this place. Not just allowed, but invited into the holy of holies. When Jesus died, well, God told a story without words whenever he ripped the curtain from the top to the bottom. 
It was his way of saying, come to me. Nothing can keep you from me. I want you here. Amen? Those assisting with communion, can you please come forward? We talked about communion a little earlier with our friend, Dr. Duncan. As you are taking communion today, my prayer to you, or for us, is that you would remember that you are forgiven. That you are worthy and that you are welcome. When Jesus was sitting with his disciples during the Last Supper, after they had had all they could have to eat and all they could have to drink, Jesus did something that he had never done before. He took some bread. Hey, guys. You're just in time. He took some bread that was laying on the table and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that has been broken for you. And he took some wine that was sitting on the table and he did the same. He said, he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. At our church, you do not have to be United Methodist to come and partake of the table of God. We believe that the table is open for all. So don't worry about whether you're allowed or not because the answer is yes. Yes, you are welcome. Yes, you are wanted. And God is waiting just for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The table is open. Please come.
Church, would you stand and would you sing with us?
sing, I am found, I am found, I am yours, I am love, I make pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, oh, I am free, oh, you are so, you are so. Remember that there is an invitation that stands not just for you, but for all. And it is our job to extend that to others. May you go forward in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.